Hello and welcome to the Keystone Kickoff Show. I'm Jim Galanti, along with T. Frank Carr. T. Frank, are you surviving the first snowstorm, the second snow event, everything going on, typical January weather in Pennsylvania? I saw something that said that uh, central Pennsylvania, or maybe it was just specifically State College, hadn't had snow in 356 days or something like that before the snowstorm last week. So I don't know. I grew up with this. I'm used to this. Um, the best thing is just don't go anywhere. But of course, <laughs> life has to happen. So that's not a, that's not a reality. So, yeah, we're getting by. I, I go by that theory. Just don't go anywhere. Yeah. Just don't go anywhere, T. Frank. All right. <laughs> Things may have slowed down. We've got a national champion now. It is mm -hmm. Michigan. Of course, we're going to get all the questions. Why can't Penn State be like Michigan? You know that's coming to you, Frank. Mm -hmm. But uh, there is no real off season. There's always activity. There's always things going on. It is transfer portal season, which means a lot of transactions going on with the Penn State roster. We need to know all about these players. That's why we have you, T. Frank. You give us the straight dope on all of these guys. Let's start with the offensive line. Let's mm -hmm. start with Nolan Rucci, six foot eight, three hundred pounds. He was the number one player in Pen Pennsylvania a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Penn State lost out to Wisconsin, and I think they lost out a lot to the fact that Nolan's brother was playing for Wisconsin. So very yeah. understandable. Yeah, but, and it was COVID, so like he couldn't like as much as he'd come seen had come and seen the university throughout his lifetime. Like the recruiting process was fractured for Penn State at that point, and as you mentioned, his brother was at Wisconsin, and he was locked down. I assume with his brother at home. So yeah, like that was a double negative for Penn State at that point. In fact, I think I remember reading some stories about that exactly being the case, where he yeah. and his brother were working out together that type of thing. Plus Wisconsin offensive lineman. You, you can't, uh, you got to respect the decision to go to Wisconsin. Not a bad one for an offensive lineman, especially when your brother's there, but he is now back in state committed to Penn state from the transfer portal. What is Penn state getting in Nolan Rucci and how does that change things for them at the offensive tackle position? So it's funny that you start with um, offensive linemen, Wisconsin, that traditional equation of developing, you know, future first round offensive linemen or guys that play in the NFL for a long time. And uh, that was not the story <laughs> for <laughs> Nolan at Wisconsin. Paul Christ fired uh, last season, I guess two seasons ago now, 2022, midway through the year. And just generally, uh, from a developmental standpoint. And then of course, from a schematic standpoint, they bring in Luke fickle, very different offense, you know, spread offense. They throw the ball a lot, not necessarily focused on the ground game and, and fundamentals and techniques up front. So, um, you know, I wouldn't say he's a raw player. The Penn state is getting, but they are getting a guy that has, uh, I wouldn't say is comfortable and not thinking about his technique. I'd say that they're getting a guy that has had some training, but it's not like he, you're getting a Wisconsin offensive lineman out of the transfer portal. You're still getting a guy that has a lot of potential and that needs some work on, you know, the things that Phil Troutwine is known for attention to detail and things like that. And well, first of all, how many years of eligibility does he have left? So he has a, he uh, took a red shirt. In 2021, he played the last two seasons, 70 total snaps. So he's got two years of eligibility left, and he does not have a, a red shirt to use at this point. So he would have to be a guy that plays the next two years if he wants to get the maximum amount of his, his time at Penn State. Okay, now he's also coming out of high school very highly regarded. As mm -hmm. we said, he was the number one pl ranked player coming out of Pennsylvania. Are those skills that made him so highly regarded in high school, are they still there? Is it just a matter of it hasn't come out yet, but that ability is still there, T. Frank? Yeah, so I, I took a look at his film from the bowl game. And this is, so he got to play the most snaps of his career, 35 total snaps against LSU. 
And, you know, remember, this is opt-out bowl. So this is not uh, against their best pass rushers and, and the full force of the LSU defense. Um, so we have a limited sample size. And that's the number one thing. Is I wrote about this over at bluewhiteillustrated.com. And it's just a, it's a limited view. But from what we can see, um, I, I just everything looked a little off. You know, he didn't look as athletic or as fluid or as explosive as he did uh, in high school. And obviously he's playing with a level of a lack of awareness in high school where he's just running around the field. Right. So you get to see kind of the untethered natural abilities of, of players outside of technique for the most part with high school players. So then you've got to dial in the technique of, okay, how do you actually do these things? How do you correctly best practices drill in the fundamentals? And that's where it's just like his balance looked a little bit off from a guy who was so big and had such great pad level and had, you know, that true six, eight frame, but still could bend and flex into position where he was a good run blocker. Um, and then as a pass protector, just moved easily around the football field. So it just like it, it kind of looks like he's stuck in neutral from a developmental standpoint of layering in those things, but not to the point where he is um, the those traits are obvious. Now, there are still times, you know, watching him in the bowl game that he just wins because he's six, eight and he, you know, he he has the basics down and he, he's able to not make fundamental mistakes to leave himself open to bad pressures and, and, you know, getting, giving up pressures and sacks and hits on the quarterback. So it's more about uh, translating that to better competition and what you're looking at. Does that look like something that can play at the big 10 level immediately this next season, you know, given that he's going to have a full season of de development, uh, you know, the winter conditioning and everything and spring ball under Phil Troutwine. So it, it <sighs> He's a good prospect. <laughs> it's it's kind of um, it's kind of like they're getting the same guy that they that they were hoping to get in high school out of the transfer portal, um, but with just like along the progression in the same spot. So if he were coming out with zero training, that would be a problem. He's only got two years left, but he's coming out with the adequate training that he needs, but maybe not the high end polish to be you know a late blooming guy with all that five star talent. I hope that makes sense. I, I it it does T Frank and it also well let me ask you this question uh he's six foot eight three hundred pounds and I can't believe I'm saying this about a three hundred pound guy but when you're talking about offensive linemen and six foot eight it seems like that's rather slender <laughs> for six foot yeah, eight for sure is this a guy who could still put on uh, more good pounds yeah I don't know what he should be you know at six eight. 320, 325, that's all in the conversation. Um, he looks lean. So when he's down in his stance, he's got adequate size, but he doesn't have like, oh, wow, looking size. Um, also, you know, like I talked about, pad level and technique are all a thing that are really big for me with any lineman, but especially if you're 6'8", it's something you've got to really look at and focus on. So he's tall. And he is in a tall stance, but generally I think his, his, um, his drive off the ball is pretty good where he keeps, he doesn't pop up like a daisy every single time he's out of his stance. He, he's first step in his momentum are forward, which is always really good when you're looking at a guy that size. But then he, when he, when he makes contact, um, if he doesn't outright win, um, there's some stalemate and some driving backwards because he doesn't have that natural size and mass in his lower body. And it is longer levers that have to fill out a little bit more. And I think it's a fair comparison to compare him in that sense to Olu Fashinu, who was kind of a sim, like a very tall six, six with very like a high waist and all those things. Um, Chuck Losey talked about how even him as an elite pass protector and as an elite offensive lineman still had to work on some stiffness in his lower body and had to main constantly maintain a level of awareness about his pad level and all of those things so that he doesn't, you know, get those losses in the run game. It's one of the reasons we didn't see him become a dominant run blocker. I think Rucci has some similar characteristics, but has the potential once he gets a little bit bigger 
to do a little more in the run game because the way he throws himself at the run game and the way he's aggressive and his explosiveness off the snap to get those reach blocks in zone, which Penn State has used the last couple of years, and I think that they'll continue to use under Andy Kotelnicki, I think he's a plus potential there as well where he can still get there. It That is about mass and, of course, continuing to refine his technique in the run game. Let's talk about how he fits in in the tackle room. Mm -hmm. We know that um, we saw a lot of Drew Shelton, obviously, as next man up. We saw a little bit of a surprise, at least to me. Anthony Dunka came in and got a lot of reps in the bowl game and acquitted himself really, really well. We have Javon Williams, a very highly regarded freshman this past year who uh, redshirted. Is Nelson a possibility to go to the tackle position, T. Frank? Where where in all this does Rucci fit in? Where is the tackle room right now? Um, It's long on talent, short on experience. And that is both good and bad. I think this is the most talent that Penn State's had uh, in the tackle room in quite some time. Um, And that's considering last year where they had a pretty good tackle room, too. So I... Maybe that's a little bit hyperbolic. Maybe last year is is where you want to start because they had, you know, they had Drew Shelton as the backup, which they've never had that luxury before. But considering the length that they have, they've never had more length in the room. And I think that might be the way I should phrase that of potential and number of guys that can fill the position to its fullest extent. The question is going to be, are any of these guys ready to perform not at the same level as Olu last year? And really... Maybe not even the same level as Caden Wallace, but just good enough that you don't get beat Um, because they need to develop and they stop me if you heard this one before. They need to mature pretty quickly. Drew Shelton's performance in the bowl game was a little bit concerning. Um, I bank on development for these guys, right? So what we see at the beginning of the season, what we see, you know, even last year during the bowl game, I don't expect to see the same thing again. And when you do, that's when you get concerned about a guy and his ceiling and, you know, what's the what's the disconnect here? And Drew had some problems uh, in that bowl game. Now, that's it's one game. You don't want to overreact to it. But now I'm going to be hyper focusing on him during spring practice in the blue white game because that is not a secured position. Remember back to 2021 and the Outback Bowl and the way that Landon Tangwall and Olu Fashinu looked together on the left side of that line and how you went, whoa, wow, what did I just see? I want to see more of that. I got to see a lot of Drew Shelton and I went, ooh, I need to see more of that on the other side. So I, I would say I'm a little bit concerned about that. All right, T. Frank, that is it for quarter number one. Stick around. Quarter number two, I'm going to ask about the latest wide receiver to suit up for Penn State, and that's going to be Julian Fleming. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome back to the Keystone Kickoff Show. He's T. Frank. I'm Jim. We're talking Penn State football. We're talking about some of the changes that have been made, what went on with the transfer portal. Quarter number one, we talked about Nolan Rucci, a former Pennsylvania guy, the number one ranked player in Pennsylvania. Guess what? T. Frank, and quarter number two, we're going to talk about another guy who yeah. was the number one player in Pennsylvania, highly recruited by Penn State, went elsewhere in the Big Ten, and now is coming home, and that is Julian Fleming. We all remember a couple of years ago, Penn State was all over Julian Fleming and recruiting for the longest time. It looked like he would be going to Penn State. He ended up a Buckeye. Spent several years there. Mostly was behind some just superstar wide receivers. Yeah. In that Ohio State wide receiver room. He also battled some injuries. uh, But he's a big guy. He's six foot two, 210 pounds. He's now made the decision to come back home to Pennsylvania, play at Penn State. You know the Nittany Lions had a great need at wide receiver. What are they getting with Julian Fleming? Uh, they're getting 
the recruiting revenge tour this <laughs> this off season, getting all of the guys they missed on over the last couple of years, especially right around that COVID time, like we talked about with with uh, Nolan Rucci. And I don't want to put COVID into the Julian Fleming thing. It's just 2020, 2021. It was a it was a rough couple of years for Penn State. They were in a bit of a transition coming out of those Trace McSorley years, um, and and they had some misses and, and making good on those here on the second go around we'll see how how that goes and i just want to circle back because i i i ran the plane off the runway a little bit at the end of the last segment i didn't totally answer your question about the tackle position for the spring i do think you would handicap drew shelton as uh the starter you know the guy with the institutional experience coming back to be the guy that starts but i I think ruchi could push him um because there are some things he does, you know, from a pass protection standpoint that we talked about that I just think Shelton really struggles with. And protecting the quarterback is the number one thing. As much as you want a good run blocker, protecting the quarterback and making sure that half of your offense can function, you know, meaning the passing game, I think that that's too vital to go well. Drew brings you some things in the run game that I, I think you just need to make sure that the pass protection is on point. Not saying that, that Rucci could be great, but, you know, he has some length and size things that Shelton is just slightly behind it. And before we get to Fleming, I would just like to add in, because I know some fans are going to react, wait a minute, this was the number one player in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't he just step right in and be starting? But there's also just a lot of value to having a guy as part of depth, especially on the offensive line. You know, it, it just does not happen where you go a full season with Your starting five in the first game is the same starting five at the end of the year. You need pieces to uh, to plug in because uh, bruises and bumps and nagging little injuries are going to happen. So there's great value in depth, even if he's not a starter. Okay, with that said, now let's shift focus to Julian Fleming. Again, another number one player coming out of the state of Pennsylvania coming back home yeah it's a little bit different here it's a i think it's a clearer picture of what julian fleming is um i don't think the five star evaluation is necessarily where he ended in his career and he's just like i was watching film of him at the beginning of the year um the from this past season quarterback play is a huge part of this because you know there's two or three plays a game where he's behind the secondary there was a game, I think it was the Notre Dame game, where he runs a post, and it's kind of a clear-out route. He's, you know, I'd say the primary focus of that play. He's not the number one target, but he gets past the safety. So, like, he's not slow. He's a linear guy that has build-up speed, so he's not he's not slow, but he's not a guy that is an ultra-separator in the short area that is a number one, get-open-all-the-time, megastar wide receiver. So he's got some talents and some you know, mentioned physicality, his contested catch numbers are good, but there's a lot of middle ground with Julian Fleming where, you know, I mentioned he's a big linear guy. And in that Ohio state offense, you would, you would imagine that's, you know, really good because they're a vertical passing attack. They're trying a lot of times to stretch the field this past year. They didn't have the tackles to hold up and to pass protect. So a lot of those opportunities were muted. The quarterback, not as good. So those opportunities we're a little bit muted and the production has a perception thing to it. But then you get down to watching the film and watching him run routes and watching him do things outside of those opportunities for a big play where he gets open. And it's a lot of, okay, you know, it's good. Um, I wouldn't say he's a great route runner. Cause he's, you know, you mentioned he's a big receiver. So he does not, he has big receiver problems where he's not going to be hyper uh, electric in his transitions and, creating separation that way. So he's a guy that, you know, I'm wondering, and I need to learn more again, you know, this off season, now that we're into January, really dive into Andy Kotelnicki and see what he does to get receivers open, see how he can scheme openings in the defense for against, especially zones to get somebody like Julian Fleming at the second level with the opportunity to use that size to catch and run. And I think that's going to be a part of the conversation. Not necessarily does he line up and win against one-on-one on the outside? Cause I don't, I don't know that he's that guy either, but he can be an, a very valuable veteran receiver, kind of like what they were looking for last year. Somebody come in and be dependable and to run the right route, to be at the right spot and to get open as best he can, given his talents. And I think that's where he's going to end up for Penn State this this coming year. 
And uh, T. Frank, you often talk about this, that uh, there are the slot guys, there are the outside guys. Penn State seems to be uh, deeper in the slot. Is this definitively an outside guy? I know his body size gives Penn State something a little different than they have in the wide receiver room. But is that one of the other differences? He could line up definitely on the outside, Mm -hmm. not a slot guy. So uh, part of that, and this is where I have to unlearn some things. Part of that was the type of receiver that Mike Yersich used primarily at previous stops was a big physical vertically inclined receiver to beat press and get open down the sideline outside the numbers, which is not at all what happened at Penn state at any point under his uh, time, but he never had that type of receiver We thought Mitchell Tinsley could be, you know, a James Washington esque player. Didn't turn out that he could get open that way, especially in the big 10 against corners and, and systems that are designed like the big 10 is ultra keep a lid on everything. Not going to play wide open football, not going to allow you to get those deep shots. So um, is Julian Fleming that? And does that matter under Andy Kolnicki? And that goes back to how are we using the players that we have? What is it's a little less rigid, I would say, of like guys lining up in one spot and trying to win those ways. The other part of what I was focusing on and kind of just shining a spotlight on is Penn State under uh, Taylor Stubblefield was recruiting a lot of guys that were same, same. You know, they had the same positional skills. They had the same positional deployment in the long term of most of these guys tended to lean towards slot receivers. And and now that math has completely changed. You got Malik McLean on the roster. Now you have um, you have Julian Fleming. Keandre Lambert Smith has versatility inside and outside in the slot. So the fact that you've got a couple of slot guys that I think are good in terms of uh, uh, Caden Saunders, Liam Clifford, that can provide you that plus. you know, Anthony Ivy, I think, can can factor into this as an outside receiver. I think the balance is much better now. So I'm less concerned about that and more about the skills just to get open and to win because they've kind of fixed the, the, the issues that I was concerned with of you've got all these Jahan Dotson clones that aren't very big and there's only one Jahan Dotson. What you had was a bunch of guys that couldn't get open because they weren't physical enough to get through press. Now the question is like, the other skills that receiver you don't want to swing too far the other way and have a bunch of big receivers that can't get open against man coverage (laughs) because they, you know, they're, they're not slow enough or they're, they're too slow and they can't get through their transition as quickly. So it's, it's a constantly a balancing act. And the number one thing is just get dudes that can get open. And I think that's really what it comes down to. And when people kind of point that out to me, I'm like, yes, but also these other things are factors too. So like it's always a shifting target. All right, let's talk more about where Julian Fleming fits in in that wide receiver room. Yeah. Uh, An article came out talking about the the current roster and where it's at. Um, A little bit of a surprise to me after the way the season finished. Keandre Lambert-Smith is still listed on the roster. There's actually 14 guys listed wide receiver. Mm -hmm. Where does Julian Fleming fit in? And... How's the dust going to settle with this? You've got 14 guys. Theoretically, that's like five deep at the wide receiver position. Somehow, I suspect come next fall, there's not going to be 14 wide receivers there. So this is this is the first exit ramp that we're getting out of in the transfer portal, right? So the transfer portal window window is closed or is closing. And just the nuance there (laughs) between how it all fits into academic calendars, all of these things that I'm learning about. It's like, that's just too much for me when I'm a foot, like I'm a football guy. So I don't know about the academics, the enrollment, the eligibility, all of those things. But there, I do know that there's another transfer portal window after spring practice. So yeah, there are going to be guys that are going to have tough conversations. Uh, but this is what James Franklin wanted, right? He wants competition. He wants guys to come in and fight for a position. And Julian Fleming comes, uh, walks in as a veteran receiver who has a lot of knowledge of the position in a room that is vastly unproven. So you got to assume he's coming in as one of the top three receivers on the team, possibly top two. So and I'd say likely. <laughs> top two given that there's absolutely nobody on this roster that's really proven anything including 
they're reliable guys. The guys that you would say are the leaders. Keandre Lambert Smith after this year proved nothing. Like he proved that he was not a guy that was going to lead and carry an offense. And um, fair or not, Trey Wallace proved he's a guy that you can't rely on to be available. So this is a wide open room. And all of that can change in an instant. Keandre Lambert Smith has the talent to turn it on at any point. He just has to turn it on and keep it on. Trey Wallace has the talent to be probably their most explosive, most dynamic receiver in a holistic sense of explosiveness, catching, leaping, all of those things. But he's got to do it. You know, Julian Fleming is a guy who's done it, but I think you know what his floor and his ceiling are. The rest of the room has to shake itself out. And I, I kind of, now that I'm talking about it, I'm kind of seeing Julian Fleming as kind of a center point that everything else around swirls. So he's going to come in, and, and for the most part, I imagine he'll be a pretty constant figure of th- everything we just described, and then kind of a stock market of the rest of the receivers is going to determine what happens during the winter and the spring. And you mentioned, you know, uh, Trey Wallace, I think, is the real wild card here. Without injuries, I mean, I think he's got the highest ceiling. Yeah, and his his hands have to get better. I think that's a part of the conversation. Again, we <laughs> there's a profile of a guy that maybe has some drop issues, but then he has a couple games where he caught seven of eight balls, and I don't know which person he is on a consistent basis because I've I've never seen him. Like I don't get to see practice, so I, I I'm sitting here with you in the stands, going, well, I guess we'll find <laughs> out. Hey, not to sitting with Jim is such a bad thing, T. Frank. No. All right, that's it for quarter number two. Stick around. We've got your questions. We're going to ask T. Frank next. Hello and welcome back to the Keystone Kickoff Show. He's T. Frank. I'm Jim. We are now in quarter number three of our show. You know what that means. It's time to take your questions and we ask T. Frank. And T. Frank always comes up with the spectacular answers. If you want to send your question in for T. Frank, real easy, just download our app, Keystone Sports, and you'll see the Ask T. Frank button, and away you go. You ready to go, T. Frank? I slept, so yes, I feel like I actually have some awareness about me to understand the question. Sometimes you say that like, yeah, I'm going to give you the... There are times I listen back to the show, I'm like, did I even hear the question? (laughs) So I think we're on the right track today. I'm feeling alert. (laughs) All right, very good. We love an alert T. Frank. So here we go. Let's start with Rich in Greensburg, who says, I don't understand why it's hard for an elite athlete playing center to snap a ball accurately in the shotgun formation. Seemed like Aller was frequently bending over to field a low snap this year. In the Alabama-Michigan game, the Alabama center's low snaps may have cost Alabama the game, With all the other amazing athletic feats these guys perform, it doesn't seem like it would be that hard to consistently snap the ball waist high to a quarterback. Okay. Uh, (laughs) I'll I'll put the question in for. Thank you. Thank you. There's not a question in there. There's just, there's just Hunter Norzad. You were, you're mad at Hunter Norzad for the way he played this year. And, and I think that if the low snaps were there and he also was impeccable in pass protection, you'd probably forgive some of the low snaps. I don't think Hunter Norzad was so bad this year to lump him in with what happened during the national champion, the semifinal where it affected one of the most visible plays, one of the most probably in the end, one of the more famous plays that we're going to see in college football history with the lure of the Rose bowl and the final play and a low snap. And he's Jalen Milrow has to, to run the ball in that situation. Um, just generally, though, I agree with the premise of snaps are the first thing that you practice. Guys that aren't even the center get practice at snap. So, like, I've seen Vega you want to take giving, you know, getting uh, reps at center and getting reps at snapping the football. Um, part of it is, and I'll, I'll explain as far as I understand through scheme, in terms of what are these guys being asked to do. And I think that's important couple of situations that come up with snaps nose tackle guy right over your face you've got to snap and react so you got to bring your hands up quickly so maybe you don't get the right action on the snap the second thing is when you got to snap and run and penn state ran a lot of outside zone this year and part of what they were focusing on was uh norzad and his athleticism to reach block uh guys that are a gap or a gap and a half away 
And that's a hard thing to do. Now, I know that there's probably going to be some low snaps that somebody would bring up as a counter when they're just in pass protection, right? Like, so all he has to do is snap and, and get into a pass pro stance. And that's true. And like, I don't have an answer for you. Like he just needed to be better at those things. But those are some of the things that I, I've, I've heard, I've learned about of areas where it does affect the center to have defensive or offensive schematic things affecting you where you have to react very quickly in those situations. And I'm glad you brought up the uh, nose tackle right on top of the center. Uh, Rich, I think you got to at least factor that in, that there's someone 320 pounds directly across from you looking to take your head off as soon as you, you release the ball. But where I will agree with Rich is, I do think it was a factor during the season. There were a couple games, uh, T. Frank, where it just seemed like every snap was low for Drew Auer, mm-hmm. and and that does muddy up the timing of things. Yes, absolutely. Okay, let's go to Sue and Howard, PA. Do you know where Howard is, T. Frank? I do. Yeah, I know. Where, and I think I, if this is who I think it is, I know Sue. So I'm excited to see what Sue has to say. Okay, are you going to share with me where Howard is? Uh, Howard is, there's a, the, I think it's Bald Eagle Lake. Beautiful area. Um, just outside State College. You just go down 80 uh, east, and then you get off, um, and there's just some beautiful area out there as far as, like, nature and stuff like that. I should know that. That's how I get to State College. Anyway, across 80. So Sue says, throughout the year, I've heard that the major issue with Penn State's passing game was the wide receivers. They're not getting open. They're not separating. They're not where they're supposed to be. We have multiple wide receivers. None of them have been successful. Lambert Mm -hmm. Smith was the number one receiver for a while. Then he faded out. Maury Evans, super fast. Seen him catch long passes in the past. Yet this year, he's been completely ineffective. Is this fully the responsibility of the wide receivers, or is this more about coaching or scheming? I just can't believe that. None of our wide receivers were able to prove themselves. It just seems like there must be something deeper going on. Can you shed, shed some light on the situation? And can so we I'll, trust our, our new offensive coordinator can fix the problem? Um. Yeah, I can't give you a guarantee, but all the signs point to Andy Kotelnicki, this being a thing he does very well, which is getting guys open outside of their individual talents of route running, etc. So I'm going to I'm going to go back to something James Franklin said um, about the receivers and about using players and the the abilities that they have instead of focusing on the abilities that they don't have and why Amari Evans got more play at the end of the year because they put him in there to be the speed guy, which to remind everybody, they did that in 2022 as well. Um, So I do think it is a little bit of the coaching and it's on the list of things that I imagine James Franklin was displeased with and why Mike Yersich was fired after the Michigan game. So you can put that up to coaching a little bit. I'm still getting to know Marcus Higgins and his effect on the receiver room. So I don't want to just throw all of this at his feet as well. I also know that the receivers have a big part to play in the execution of what they're asked to do. And I've mentioned, I mentioned this in the last segment. um, And I'm going to say it again here. You look at the, who they designed the offense around after that. And it was a major de-emphasis of the receivers and put an emphasis on the tight ends and the running back. So to end the season, our perception of that is because of what Penn State did. And then finally, um, you know, it is a little bit about the the general room and some of the the lacking of a number one, right? A number one to take the pressure off everybody else and to have a specific skill set that gets open deep out wide. You would have thought that Keandre Lambert Smith, who's got great speed and agility and all these things, but he never consistently got open deep down the field um, to to relieve pressure on the whole passing game and kind of open things up for everybody else. So it it is a it is a varied um, process problem, you know, so like they don't have the guys on the outside to win consistently. So how do you compensate? How do you get them open? I felt like at times they were force feeding Dre. And I felt like that was a detriment to the offense. And then finally, you know, the scheme and not creating easy opportunities that the quarterback can take advantage of all the time. That's, I think, where Andy Kolnicki comes in and, and is going to 
that's his reputation. Okay, let's go to Matt in Massachusetts. He says, Jim and T. Frank, about players opting out for the draft in the postseason with the new college football playoff format. Can you share your thoughts and concerns about players opting out since the playoff is expanded? Seems to me there's a lot more risk than before. I think he means there's more ri- with 12 teams in the playoff, there's more right. risk of guys potentially sitting out a playoff game. I have a hard time believing that if a college football championship is on the line, I have a hard time believing it'll lead to more opt-outs. It is not so rampant. And I could be wrong, but I I think that that fixes the problem for the 12 teams in the playoff, and then it makes it worse for the rest of the teams that are in bowl games. Because the incentive of a college football playoff, which they've been working for their whole lives, is a very strong draw. It's not, I don't think it's as mercenary as that. Where it's like, well, you know what? Now I've got to, I'm going to hold out or I'm going to uh, opt out because my regular season was great. Like, those are out valuations against the best of the best, which can create draft stock for yourself as well. So I, I don't, I don't, I disagree. I, I don't think that that would be a problem. I would view that as those 12 teams, maybe it was four. Now we got 12 teams that have less of a chance for opt outs. I'm in full agreement with you, T. Frank. Uh, you hit it with the four playoff teams. There wasn't to talk about all the opt outs. It was both good teams who just missed the playoffs mm-hmm. who were the teams with the opt outs, Penn state, Ohio state, Florida state. Yep. Those games were affected and they all have the same thing in common. All those teams would have been playoff teams in the 12 team playoff. Yep. And the other part to the two, two other points to make. Remember, the teams that are going to be non-playoff teams starting next year, they're not going to be obviously one of the top 11 or 12 teams, so they probably don't have the same NFL talent that those teams have. Right, right. And and the other part to this is, remember, those playoff games are going to start like in mid-December. Yeah. So it's not like, oh, if I'm a high draft pick, i got to wait till January to play. Uh, the playoff games. Half of those teams are going to be done in the middle of December. Yeah. Uh, once they lose their first playoff game. All right, uh, T. Frank. Let's go to Tim and Charlotte, who says, "T. Frank, love your stuff. Not much talk about the loss of Taylor Stubblefield and his impact on the wide receiver room. Mm-hmm. He was known as a technician, and Penn State had some solid wide receiver play during his time here." Can you deduce anything from the tape that would tell you that we miss him as a technician? I'm not sure. Is Tim a relative of uh, Taylor Stubblefield? Anyway. (laughs) (laughs) I I don't know. Uh, It's that's okay. So there's a, that we've reached the limits of T Frank's powers. I am not a wide receiver coach. Um, and I understand the basics of the position and I work every day. And last night I was watching film on, you know, different techniques for different routes, but I mean, there's a level of detail that I don't get to. So getting down to the nitty gritty of, uh, how players are creating separation is still not necessarily my strength. I can identify players that are doing things correctly and understand, you know, kind of the the general rule of how they're creating separation and how they're doing these things, concepts of routes and different combinations to get guys open. But I, I, I could not tell you if Marcus Higgins is having an impact, positive or negative, on guys he didn't recruit. And I'd say that's the main thing. The general thing, and I asked him about this specifically, is that it seems like his style of coaching has more to do with the physical aspect than the detail aspect of, Okay, I want to catch the ball. Here's an example. I want to catch the ball, and I want to be square when I catch the ball so that I can turn either way. I want to high point the ball, focusing on those things to create those contested catch wins. How to do those things more so than I need you to take three steps and separate. That is something he does, but I think the extra emphasis is on those other things around that. All right, that's going to have to be it, T. Frank. And remember, this is only one year for him in the program. Yeah. We will come back with more Penn State football talk right after this. 
Hello, welcome back to the Keystone Kickoff Show. It's quarter number four. He is T. Frank. I am Jim. T. Frank, early in the show, we talked about some of the transfer portal guys coming in. We talked about Nolan Rucci uh, being part of the Penn State offensive line. Then we talked about Julian Fleming entering the wide receiver room. Now it's time to talk about some of the other, I'm not sure if player activity, but players re-upping, players yeah. deciding to stick with Penn State. And that's also very big news. And one of those items, or two items, that I thought was a little bit under the radar, but really, really important, was Akeem Beeman and Devon Ellis both saying that they will be returning at the defensive tackle position for Penn State. I don't know about you, but I think that's very important. I think it's critical because you bring back a personality and something that you can tangibly hold on to with this defensive uh, lineup. You know, the corners are changing. The defensive ends are changing. Those are the two most important positions on the team. So you'd like to have something returning that you can bank on. And for the first time in a long time, James Franklin's squad is strong up the middle. You know, the defensive tackle depth and production from last year, which everyone came into the season saying, are they going to be big enough? Are they going to be good enough? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was proven throughout the year that they were a part of the solution for the Nittany Lions. And at the end of the year, Kobe King fully got the defense, it felt like. And suddenly you have a strength between him and um, Abdul Carter in their ability to stop the run set up by the fact that the defensive tackles, especially and specifically Devon Ellis, having an excellent year up front where he was physically dominating guys across from him, maybe not to the level of the national championship where somebody's on their butt and they're getting, you know, pure pressure up the middle, but resetting the offensive line on the other side of the line of scrimmage, penetration, power, holding up at the point of attack. Zane Durant took not quite a star turn by the end of the year, but really came on as a, as a guy that I think he even started taking snaps away from other veterans. Um, now you've got that depth returning and Hakeem Beeman coming back as a part of that gives you that flexibility to play, you know, maybe three technique and one technique. If you want to, you can still play left, right and mix and match, but you've got a depth of talent and a depth of variety on the, on the defensive line that you come back with a, a tangible personality for the defense up front. And I think that's a huge thing for a team that, you don't want to be in transition. You know, I know the defensive ends are talented. I know Denai Dennis Sutton, you know, can bridge that gap, but there's no question that the defensive tackles can do it because they're all back and we saw them do it. And the one other name that you didn't mention yet was Kazai Izzard is also going yep. to be back. Yeah, and he's a guy who, you know, of the three, you know, Ellie's and Izzard and Beeman, I think all of them have unique skill sets that make them, you know, stand out above the other two. But Izzard, I think, is the most well-rounded where you, I expected at some point in his career, he could also be a plus pass rusher. Uh, so he's got the size and some movement skills to be um, a good pass rusher. Whether all of that develops or not, it doesn't matter because you've got Ellie's and, and Vandenberg and, uh, you know, all the depth players as well that I, I think it's going to create a positive environment for these guys. The only question is, um, you know, <laughs> you've got a lot of depth now at defensive tackle, and there's some young guys that have been waiting their turn after spring ball. Does everyone feel like, you know what, I'm still going to wait my turn, and I'm going to be a part of this picture going into, um, you know, the, the season? But you feel like you have a three deep here um, that is pretty talented, and I think a, a pretty good opportunity for Penn State to be great on the defensive line again, which, which once again, Tom Allen, the new defensive coordinator, it's been a very long time, if ever, that he's had a strength at the defensive line uh, for his defense. So that'll be interesting to see how that affects what he does with his, uh, his schemes. But the point, too, is just depth. I mentioned this when we were talking about Nolan Rucci on the offensive line. Whether he comes in and immediately starts or not, he is still valuable because he creates such depth at the position. That's the feeling even more so, I feel, at defensive tackle where yeah. this team has always rotated those guys in. They've at least played too deep, or as James Franklin says, what uh, he wants a position uh, – two and a half deep at each right. position. Yep. Which a two would deep mean he... plus injury insurance is how I'd look at that. Yes, and I think I saw that there's nine defensive tackles on the roster, 
uh, including the young guys. So that gives them time to develop. But speaking of the roster, and, you know, we go back to that wide receiver position where there were so many guys, there has, they do have to thin out some of these players. There were 14 wide receivers, scholarship wide receivers on the roster. Mm -hmm. Overall, T. Frank, from the listing that I saw, there would be 20, uh, I'm sorry, 94 uh, scholarship players on the roster right now. They've got to somehow do the math to get it from 94 down to 85. I don't know how any of that stuff works. Um, and talking to people and, and listening to Sean Fitz here on uh, the BWI live show, he's like, hey, don't try to do the math. It's not going to make sense. They know how to do it. They know what they're doing. They'll be at the, the scholarship limit. But if you try and figure out what they're doing, it doesn't make any sense. So I have taken that as, you know, just being like, OK, so this is the ro just like look at the roster. This is the roster. But you're right. Like even for, let's look at it from a playtime perspective. Penn State's always wanted to have, again, two and a half deep. So that's six, seven receivers that can contribute. And then how many of those are developmental guys, young guys that are working behind the scenes to be, um, you know, part of the future? Uh, 14's a lot. And none of these guys really are in that developmental phase, you would say, because a lot of these, you know, five, four of them were from the class. I'm trying to remember exactly how many are left in the class of 2022, where we talked about Taylor Stubblefield earlier, and that class of 2022, headlined by Caden Saunders, you know, I think that he he's kind of the one that we know the most about in terms of what he's going to be at this level. I think he's a dude that gets open. He just needs the opportunity to get on the field, and they need to target him in those situations, but he's not going to be the KJ Hamler clone that I think we all thought early in his career, but beyond those guys, they were all talented project players where it's like, Hey, look at these traits, but, and that's really where, you know, you're, you're talking about Taylor Stubblefield and now Marcus Hagans. They've got a lot of these guys that need to develop and rubber meet the road time. They didn't do it last year. Nobody from that group really pushed, um, you know, into this. Now this is the year. So you've got your veterans at the top. I'd, I'd include Liam Clifford there, Keander Lambert-Smith. You know, of course, now you've got um, Julian Fleming within that group, Malik McLean. So you've got a variety of size, body type, talent, position flexibility among the guys that are veterans that you expect to be part of the conversation. And then somebody's got to step up and develop and be a part of the pressure to create competition. James Franklin talked about since this year, this time last year, he wants competition in the receiver room to elevate everybody's play and including the starters, including the guys like, uh, you know, Trey Wallace and Keandre Lambert Smith, who were like those two have separated. And then it's kind of a pack. Of, it's the, the field. I think based on last year, like everyone needs competition in this room. So I think they're getting what they want, but are any of those guys going to actually rise to the occasion? And that's going to be the question for Marcus Higgins this year. And of course, um, you know, the receivers they've assembled, that is somebody going to actually step up and do it because they absolutely need someone to step up and do it. And this is where that portal uh, after spring practice comes into play. There are right. going to be guys, they'll realize where they are in the pecking order. And some of those guys who've been around for a few years, they're yeah. either going to have to uh, become part of the two deep or even three deep or they will probably figure it out themselves, uh, T. Frank. The one a other area that needs some attention is cornerback. Mm -hmm. Where there's, I think, three NFL players left the program to go go play on Sundays, right. and we know that they're gone. That's a place where they could also use help um, at the top end. We've heard some names of guys, specifically the names. Tony Grimes and A.J. Harris mm -hmm. as two pretty highly regarded guys when they came out of high school that Penn State was after. Uh, we should mention that Tony Grimes has now announced that he's headed to Michigan State. Uh, Penn State hopefully will be able to get A.J. Harris. Uh, as of the time we're recording, there was no commitment from him. But can you tell us a little bit about A.J. Harris? How good mm -hmm. is he? And how important would be getting someone like that on the roster? I don't think he's a plug and play starter because he was a class of 2023 corner. So he's also a young player who kind of fits in 
I don't know exactly if Zion Tracy Elliott Washington, you know, exactly, but you know, in that, in that age bracket development bracket sort of thing. Um, so it's funny. You mentioned 14 wide receivers where, well, it, you know, just not that I'm, I just said, don't do the math, but if you do the math, there's only six corners on the roster right now. So not only is it a situation where they're losing three NFL guys, but they just don't have a whole lot of bodies on the roster. Now they bring in John Mitchell and Antoine Belgrave shorter as a part of this class of 2024. So that group is going to get a couple of freshmen that everyone feels like has an opportunity to contribute, but you'd like to have a more mature player. Grimes would have been the veteran to come in and step in and be a part of the rotation. AJ Harris is more on the Johnny Dixon side where he is a young, talented player, a future starter that could contribute this year and has the very ability to be a starter or a part of the rotation. And that's what they need. Like they need more bodies. And to me, he's a long-term development player, but also a guy that a little bit like Nolan Rucci, where, you know, he could contribute this year, but also the long-term development is excellent corner, keeping the standard of talent the same at that position, which Penn State absolutely needs to stay among the elite on defense. You cannot have slippage. You have to have elite talent at corner and defensive end to do some of the things that they've done previously of being so aggressive. Now it'll change and it'll tweak with, uh, with, with Tom Allen, but the tenants of defense don't really change. If you can lock down corner and, uh, you know, receiver, then you can do a bunch of different things, more exotic things with the defense because you have confidence in those positions. So AJ Harris, if he were to commit to the Nittany Lions, um, you know, again, I don't know the situation there specifically, but he would be among the I, Zion Tracy looked pretty good from a talent perspective. And I went back and watched his film. He's got a good awareness. He's got a good head on him for football. So he's going to be one of the players that plays next year. And then it's if Harris commits, where does he fit within that particular tier of maybe two or three on the, on the roster? Well, the thing is, too, uh, like we talked at defensive tackle, more players you want to be two and a half deep. And remember, uh, Daquan Hardy was not one of the top two cornerbacks, but just playing in that slot position, yep. he was essentially a third starter. So it's if you need three starting cornerbacks, another three backups as part of the rotation – it means they could use more depth. Hopefully, A.J. Harris will be part of that, T. Frank. Yep. All right, that has to be it for our show. Thanks for all the great info today, T. Frank. Make sure you all join us next time on the Keystone Kickoff Show. <laughs>